hope. What is hope? You know, we've been talking about hope for uh, a couple months now. You've heard it in sermons. You've heard it in devotions that we've given. You've probably heard people even outside of the Christian community talking about hope. That during this time where it seems like there's uh, much hopelessness, that we need to find hope. Uh, and I believe that that's true. Uh, and a lot of the things that we've already talked about in many of these devotions um, go back to this idea of what true hope is all about. Uh, but today I want to take some time to really just kind of hone in and zero in on what we're going to be looking at when we talk about hope. How important it is to have real hope during this time. Uh, because without real hope, um, it's very easy for us to get very discouraged. It's very easy for us to get down and out, depressed, just want to give up on life. Uh, it's very easy for us to get to this place if hope isn't in our lives. And I'm going to propose to you today that what hope is about when we look at Scripture, when we talk about how we should hope, uh, when we look at those things, uh, it's not going to necessarily be how the world would would define hope. Uh, you see, we we do hear the world talking about hope. I hope that this quarantine will be over soon. Maybe you've heard people say, I hope that my favorite restaurant will be open soon, or I hope that I'll be able to go on my vacation, uh, or, or I hope that, um, well, I hope that somebody that I love won't get sick. We, there's lots of times that people will use this word hope, and right now we're in the midst of uh, this weird life that isn't normal for us, what we're used to, and so therefore we can struggle with hopelessness. And so we decide to try to find hope in something. We try to find hope in, in financial success. We try to find hope in other people. We try to find hope in um, planning uh, something uh, ahead of time that we can kind of look forward to. Uh, and I'm not saying all these things are wrong to do, uh, but we need to make be very careful as Christians not to find ultimate hope in any of these things. Uh, the world tells us this. I looked at this today. Yeah, I wasn't just reading this for fun. I was looking up uh, what the world would say hope is, and I found that this on Psychology Today. So this is the secular psychologist view of what hope is. And they say this, Hope is the expectation, feeling, and belief that the future will be full of desired, meaningful events and outcomes. Without hope, it is difficult to imagine why or how humans would persevere. And indeed, hopelessness is a very strong predictor of suicidal behavior and intentions. Now, let me just start by saying I agree with the second part of this statement. Uh, without hope, it is difficult to really understand why we do persevere in this life. And that hopelessness does lead people down a road of depression and down into a road of giving up on life or giving up on others, uh, even to the point of suicide. Uh, this, is, this is very true. I think that statement is true in what is said here in psychology today. However, when we look at what they define hope as, I think there's something missing here. It says, hope is the expectation, feeling, and belief that the future will be full of, watch this, desired, meaningful events and outcomes. The way hope is defined by the world is based on circumstances. It's based on what can happen and that good things will happen. Really what ends up coming out of this is that hope is seen as optimism. That hope and optimism are basically the same thing. Now, I don't know if you're optimistic or if you're pessimistic. Everybody has a different... Uh, different bent to how they are, uh, and uh, I believe in most cases I find myself to be myself to be optimistic. I, I tend to hope and think that things are going to go well, uh, even if it might not seem that way. I tend to uh, think well of people um, and think well of the fact that they will change for the better, uh, and uh, not always. There's some times that I might be pessimistic about situations in my life, but most of the time I find myself to be optimistic, but I know several people in my life who are uh, much more pessimistic. Um, and, uh, and I want to just say that when we talk about optimism or pessimism, a lot of times we kind of paint it as this um, battle that uh, I'm better if I'm optimistic and you're worse if you're pessimistic or vice versa. But I think both optimism and pessimism miss the point of life, whereas optimism says everything is going to get better. Pessimism says nothing is going to get better. And I think both of them are really not the way that we're talking about because optimism and pessimism both focus in on the situations or circumstances that we find ourselves in life. Now, biblical hope, real hope that comes from God is not about being an optimist. And the video we're going to watch today from the Bible Project in just a moment is going to make that point. That biblical hope is more than just saying, oh, I think everything's going to turn out well or things are going to get better. It doesn't focus on situations. It actually focuses on uh, a person, and it focuses on a truth. It focuses on what we know to be true, 
not just what we feel like might be true. See, optimism and pessimism are both based in feelings. And although those things aren't wrong to feel, the way we react and the way we act on those feelings can be very much detrimental to us. And so when we talk about hope, I don't want us to think that we're talking about if you right now are feeling like um, things are just really down and you're, you're not, and I'm telling you today, you need to just buck up and you need to start being optimistic and start saying everything's going to get better. That is not the hope that we're talking about. Um, but if you're a pessimist and you're saying, well, yeah, nothing's going to get better, so there's no, there's, no, there's no point to life, there's no point to even worrying about it, there's no point to anything, I think that's just as detrimental to our health and our thoughts and our spiritual life to put ourselves in that because both pessimism and optimism are both looking at circumstances and then making our feelings develop around those circumstances, and that is not finding true hope or anything that is beneficial. And so today we're going to talk about the biblical concept of hope. How is it that we can have hope in this time of hopelessness? How is it that we can have hope in a time where this world is upside down and our life is in a, is operating in a way that we are not used to? How do we find true hope? And we're going to look at a couple passages today, and we're also going to look at a video, as I said earlier, from the Bible Project. So we're going to start with the video. They're going to give you some background. They're going to talk about Hebrew words and Greek words. That That's not my strength. That's Justin's strength, so I'm going to let them do that uh, for me. But then we're going to just take some moments to look at three passages of Scripture quickly today and talk about what real hope looks like. And finally, I want to end with a warning uh, of what would what will happen if we don't uh, have true hope. Uh, and so in all that, hopefully today you will find encouragement. Uh, as the day is drawing near, we are called to encourage one another, and I hope you find encouragement from today's devotion. But with that all in mind, I want you just to take a look at this video, uh, watch it, and just listen to what they have to say about hope. So let's say you want to describe the feeling of anticipating a future that's better than the present. You might be giddy or excited or maybe unsure, but most of us know that experience. We call it hope. It's a state of anticipation and it's crucial for healthy human existence. And it's a really important concept in the Bible. In fact, there are many words for hope in the ancient languages of the Bible and they're all fascinating. In the Old Testament, there are two main Hebrew words translated as hope. The first is yachal, which means simply to wait for. Like in the story of Noah and the ark, as the flood waters recede, Noah had to yachal for weeks. The other Hebrew word is kava, which also means to wait. It's related to the Hebrew word kav, which means cord. When you pull a kav tight, you produce a state of tension until there's release. That's kava, the feeling of tension and expectation while you wait for something to happen. The prophet Isaiah depicts God as a farmer who plants vines and kavahs for good grapes. Or the prophet Micah talks about farmers who both kavah and yachal for morning dew to give moisture to the land. So in biblical Hebrew, hope is about waiting or expectation. But waiting for what? In the period of Israel's prophets, as the nation was sinking into self-destruction, Isaiah said, at this moment, the Lord's hiding his face from Israel, so I will kavah for him. The only hope Isaiah had in those dark days was the hope for God himself. You find the same notion of hope all over the book of Psalms where these words appear over 40 times. In almost every case, what people are waiting for is God. Like in Psalm 130, the poet cries out from a pit of despair, I kavah for the Lord, let Israel yachal for the Lord because he's loyal and will redeem Israel from its sins. Biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see in any situation how circumstances could work out for the best. But biblical hope is not focused on circumstances. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence things will get better but you choose hope anyway. Like the prophet Hosea, he lived in a dark time when Israel was being oppressed by foreign empires and he chose hope when he said God could turn this valley of trouble into a door of hope, like the day when Israel came up from the land of Egypt. God had surprised his people with redemption back in the days of the Exodus and he could do so again. So it's God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. It's like the poet of Psalm 39 who says, And now, O Lord, what else can I kavah for? You are my yachal. In the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus cultivated the similar habit of hope. They believed that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's surprising response to our slavery to evil and death. The empty tomb opened up a new door of hope. 
and they use the Greek word elpis to describe this anticipation. The Apostle Peter said that Jesus' resurrection opened up a living hope, that people can be reborn, to become new and different kinds of humans. More than once, the Apostle Paul says the good news about Jesus announces the El Peace of glory. In both cases, this El Peace is based on a person, the risen Jesus who has overcome death. And this hope wasn't just for humans. The Apostles believed that what happened to Jesus in the resurrection was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. In Paul's words, it's a hope that creation itself will be liberated from slavery to corruption into freedom when God's children are glorified. So Christian hope is bold, waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death. And some would say it's crazy, and maybe it is. But biblical hope isn't optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. That's what the biblical words for hope are all about. Well, I hope that video uh, helped you maybe to understand the concept of hope throughout Scripture, especially as we look at the, the wording and, and how the original language really does speak to what hope is all about. It's about waiting on God. It's about waiting on Jesus. Uh, and uh, those are things that we're going to explore even more as we look at these Scriptures. But one thing I really want to focus in on as we go through all of this, and this will come up time and time again, but the whole time I introduced this this devotion, I talked about the idea that um, optimism, pessimism is based on a feeling. I want to be very clear, when we talk about hope, hope isn't based on a feeling. Hope is based on truth. Uh, they kind of said it in the video, but I would say this, hope isn't how we feel, it's what we choose. Hope is a choice. Hope is a choice. And, and we're going to see that David uh, in uh, Jeremiah, uh, most likely, uh, and uh, and Paul, uh, three uh, people throughout the scope of the scriptures, look at this and have this very clear picture that hope is a choice. And so I want to say today that no matter where you find yourself or how hopeless you feel, make the choice to have hope, to wait on God. And that's what we're going to look at today. So we're going to start with David. We're going to talk about Psalm 62. I'm not going to read the whole psalm here. But we're going to look at a couple sections of Psalm 62. And if you know David's story, you know David's life was far from easy. He had some really good times, some really high mountains that he was on top, but he had a lot of low valleys. Uh, and many times people were after him, and his enemies were constantly trying to destroy him from uh, his own friends and his own family to uh, so many others. And in that time, as we see David writing the Psalms, uh, we see many times he points to the hope that he has in God. And in Psalm 62 is one of those psalms. So I'm just going to read a few verses. I'm going to start right in verse 1 of chapter 62. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Uh, later on he repeats the same idea in, in verse 5. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation and my glory, uh, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust him at all times, O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. These are David's words, and first of all, he talks about the fact that he is waiting on God, that his soul waits for God in silence that he knows that God has brought salvation and he is bringing salvation. And that is the ultimate hope that David finds. Uh, he, he talks about how his life has been hard and people are against him, but God is his rock. God is his salvation. God is his fortress and he will not be shaken. You know, we live in a world today where not only are we facing a virus that is trying to shake us, but we're facing uh, person, person to person uh, relational issues, we're, we're facing financial problems, we're facing all sorts of things that could shake us, that, want, that wants to shake us so that we will be people that don't have real hope. But David is very clear. He says, I will not be shaken, not because he's strong, not because he's a fortress, but because God is his fortress and God is his rock 
God is his refuge, as he would say later. Again, he, he in verse 5, for God alone, and I want to point out those words, David is being very clear where his hope is being found. You know, it's very tempting for us to find hope in lots of things. Uh, and during this time, I see it and I hear it. I've said the same. I've said things like I'm hoping in something that is just a circumstance that will change. I'm hoping that life will go back to normal. I'm hoping that this will happen. I'm hoping that we'll be back together, uh, congregated in church soon. I'm hoping this. I'm hoping that. And some of those hopes aren't bad. But if we get so caught up in thinking that our hope rests in circumstances, then we're going to miss out. See, David went through a lot of bad circumstances, but yet he still had hope. He chose to hope in God, his fortress, and his salvation. It's, a, it's God who gives us salvation and glory. He is the mighty rock. He is the refuge. And so after David says all that, then he gives this proclamation to people who are reading the psalm. And he says this, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. These are words directly for us to take and to heed and to think about and to meditate on. Even in a time of hopelessness, our trust our choice to trust is in God, that we choose to trust him at all times, it says, not just in the good times, not even just in the bad times, but we trust God and we have hope in God both during the bad circumstances and the good circumstances, times when we're being pessimistic and times when we're being optimistic. Either way, we need to trust in God at all times. All people need to do that. We need to do that and to pour out our heart before him because God is a refuge for us. Pour out our heart before him and just pour out the feelings of hopelessness. Pour out the pessimistic feelings. Pour out how we're feeling. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And we have the right to just expose our hearts to God and just say, God, please, this is what's going on. I trust in you. You are my refuge. You are my rock. You are my God. I will choose hope. I will trust in you. See, David understood what hope was. Hope wasn't just a feeling that things are going to get better. But hope was trusting in the rock of his salvation, who was God. Now, uh, he's not the only one. I, I want to turn to the book of Lamentations. Now, the book of Lamentations, most people agree, is written by Jeremiah. Uh, there are some who might refute this, but whether it was Jeremiah or another prophet who's writing the book of Lamentations, we find that this is one of the hardest books for us to read. And Lamentations, if you know anything about a, what a lament is, a lament is simply a time in which we cry out to God in sorrow over the way things are. Uh, and, and real quick, uh, if you read the whole book of Lamentations, which I would encourage you to do at some point, it can be kind of depressing because it is Jeremiah or the writer. It, it, he, he's taking the opportunity to basically talk about all the bad circumstances. He's really ultimate, the ultimate pessimist, really, when we look at Lamentations. But I'm going to say to you, this isn't wrong. This is in the Bible for a reason. There is a time where we need to come before God, as we just read in Psalms, and just pour out our hearts to him. And we need to say, you know, this isn't right, God. I don't understand why you're doing this. This doesn't make sense. That's not complaining. I mean, we talked about a couple weeks ago about not complaining. Um, when we complain to others or we, uh, we complain out of faithlessness, that's sin. But to lament to God and say, God, I know you're in control, but then why are things going this way? Why is it so hard? That's okay to do. Uh, we see it in Lamentations. We see it in Psalms. We see it in Job. We see it in so many places in Scripture. And the whole book of Lamentations is all about this lament. Uh, the writer here has seen uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, and he's calling out to God, and he's saying, why are you doing this? I know you're in control, but why is it happening? This isn't the way it's meant to be. Because sin has destroyed the world, the world we live in is not the way it was meant to be in the sense that God created it as a good world. But because of sin, everything has been corrupted. And so this world isn't the way it should be. And we are absolutely in our right mind to come to God and say, God, why is it like this? This shouldn't be how it is. But here in the midst of lamentations, in the midst of a lament, in the midst of despair in a lot of ways and pessimism, we see one of the most beautiful pictures of hope in all of Scripture. Because I would say this, without lament, there's no real hope. If we're just giddy and happy all the time, then that's really not finding hope in God. But when we see the world the way it is, we see the hardship of the way the world is around us, when we see how the virus has taken over our lives, when we see that and we call out to God and say, God, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, that can right away flip around to hope. Because we can say, yes, it's not the way it's supposed to be. And it might even get worse. 
but yet, God, I can still trust you because you are still God, and I can still hope in you. Even though my circumstances are terrible and I feel terrible, I can trust you anyway, and I can find hope in you. Because again, remember, hope is a choice and not a feeling. So as we have that as a background about Lamentations, in Lamentations chapter 3, uh, we see a little bit of this lamenting. We see a little bit of the writer talking about the bad things that are happening in life and how he feels. But then we're going to look at what he says is true. And so let's just take some time to look at Lamentations 3, 14 through 33. Uh, and this is where we read this. I have become the laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So is my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, for the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. And it goes on, but I want to just focus on uh, those sections. Uh, as we think about God's steadfast love and how that allows us to have hope. Pastor Justin did a phenomenal uh, devotion on the steadfast love of God his has said, and if you want to look back at that, I would encourage you to do that. And the writer of Lamentations, he starts right off, and it's so powerful, the wording here. Listen to what he says. My endurance has perished, and so is my hope from the Lord. He says, his soul is bereft of peace. He has forgotten what happiness is. As I said, the feelings here are very raw. He's telling God that this doesn't, I've watched my city be destroyed. Everything is not the way it should be. This is not right. And he laments over it. That's the whole point of this book. And he feels like there's no happiness and there's no hope. He feels like he, there's no endurance. He feels like there's no peace. He's very clear about this. And so maybe you find yourself in that place right now. Maybe you feel like this world is just turned upside down and you're being shaken. But remember, nothing can shake our hope as we're told in the Psalms. And the writer here goes on, and right after this, right after talking about how bad he feels and how bad things are, then he goes and says this, but this I call to mind in verse 21. In the midst of how he feels, he says, but I might feel one way, but I know something is true. And he says, I call to mind, and that therefore I have hope. So he says, I'm going to think about what is true, and that's going to give me hope. I'm going to make the choice to hope. That's what he's saying. And he says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. As bad as Lamentations is, as, as depressing as it can be, as depressed as the writer is here, he remembers what is true. And that is that God is steadfastly loving us. That he is never giving up. This is his covenant faithfulness to us. His mercies don't come to an end. They are new every morning. He is faithful. And so then the writer says, the Lord is my portion. And there are, therefore I will hope in him. I will choose hope even when I don't feel like it. See, that's what I want us to get today. That hope is not based on feelings. Hope is not based on being optimistic. Hope is not based on circumstances. But hope is based on God. Hope is based in this sense on Yahweh, the Lord, God, who is a covenant keeper, who is a person, who is one who shows us his steadfast love. So we can look to God and we can choose hope, even in the time of hopelessness. Finally, and I know we're running short on time, but we go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is a very famous chapter. Many of us have read it over and over and over again. I want to read a section from this and just talk for a few minutes about the hope that we have right now, no matter what the world is going on, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, no matter how we feel, what is the hope that we have as, as Christians? So in Romans 8, uh, 18, this is what we read. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. 
for the creation waits with eager longing, longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to decay and to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Lots of things we could talk about in this passage, but because of time, I just want to focus on what they said at the end of that video. We have hope because we know that Jesus is king, he's bringing a new creation, that all the futility of this world, everything we experience, all the negative feelings, the negative things that happen, all of that is coming to a point where it's all going to be recreated, everything is going to be new, and therefore we can't see it, so it's not about our circumstances, but we know it's coming, and so we wait for it with patience. We wait because of hope. We wait for Jesus to come back. We wait for him to make all things new. Now, what I want to say then is that our hope is not dependent upon our circumstances. Listen, I can't tell you right now that this quarantine, this pandemic is going to end in the six weeks that it's supposed to with three phases and into the fourth phase. I, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I don't know. There's a chance that this whole world will get even worse. And actually, the Bible tells us it will get worse. But even our present circumstances could get worse than they even are now. They could go down uh, a pit and we could continue to have trouble. We could continue to have financial trouble. Maybe uh, the coronavirus will, have, will come back even worse than it was before. Who knows? But the point is our hope isn't on the fact that maybe by the end of the summer things will be back to normal. That's not where we find hope. Our hope isn't based on our circumstances here and now. Our hope is based on Jesus coming again and setting all things right. And we may not see that in our lifetime. See, optimism says that someday in my life things will get better. We don't have that guarantee. We really don't. I hope things get better by the end of our lifetime, but we don't know. I, I hope that my life doesn't get worse, but I also know that it very well could. But even if it does, I'm going to choose to have hope. Because hope isn't based on feelings or circumstances, but hope is based on Jesus. Hope is based on the truth that Jesus loves us, that God has steadfast love for us, and that the whole world will be made new one day when he returns. That is our hope. So I would encourage you, even if you don't feel like having hope today, choose hope. And I'd also encourage you, if you're the type of person that just thinks hope is being happy and bubbly all the time, understand that it's okay to see the world in a way that says this isn't how it should be. It's okay to lament. It's okay to say this isn't how it is meant to be and this is wrong because that'll drive us to real hope. Don't find your hope in the, in the frivolous feelings of optimism. Uh, one warning, and then I'm going to end with a quote that I saw uh, from actually one of our attenders yesterday. But one warning, I want to real quickly, I was going to go back and read this, but uh, in the book of Exodus, I believe it's chapter 32, um, it's the story of the golden calf. And it's the story of the time that the Israelites decided to build an idol that they would worship instead of God. Uh, and they even called it Yahweh, so they thought that they were worshiping God himself, but they weren't. They were making an idol. Uh, they are breaking the first and second commandment right as it was given. See, Moses had gone up onto the mountain to take, get the law of God, and they knew what was happening. They knew Moses was going up there to meet with God. Israel knew that they were he was receiving laws. Uh, they saw the presence of the God in a, in a way on the mountain. They saw that it was too much for them to handle. And Moses goes up and gets the law that gets put on the tablets that will, he will break when he comes back down. Because what happens in the time that Moses is up there, he's up there for a long time, the people get restless and they don't wait for him. They don't hope in God through Moses. They don't hope. They don't choose hope. Instead, they stop waiting and they become impatient. And what we know happens when they get impatient, when they say, uh, we don't know if Moses is coming back or not. So they stop waiting on Moses, and really they stop waiting on God. They stop hoping the way they should. Then they, their hope all of a sudden turns towards this piece of golden livestock. And there's much destruction and despair, and nothing goes good for the Israelites from that situation. 
But see, I want to say that the reason they ran to idolatry is because they stopped hoping. They stopped choosing hope. They stopped waiting on God. They stopped waiting on Moses and said, well, I don't know what's going on, so therefore I don't any longer have hope in what I don't know. So I need to make something to put in front of me that I can hope in. And you say, well, I haven't made a golden calf. Well, neither have I. <laughs> but my fear is during this time, especially during these trials, that we are making idols out of other things. We may be even making idols out of our free time, making idols out of our family, making idols out of our money situation, making idols out of uh, social media, making idols out of whatever we want to make ourselves feel better, because that's where we want to feel hope. The Israelites wanted to feel hope, so they made a golden calf that they could bow down to and worship and party and do all sorts of things they shouldn't be doing around that calf. But uh, my fear is that we can do the same thing when we don't wait for God, when we don't hope in Him. Because when we don't have true hope in Him, then we're going to hope in the things of this world. And when we hope in the things of this world, it's only going to end in disaster. And so this is an encouraging time, but I want to end in a warning. Find your hope. Choose hope in God. Choose hope in Christ and His coming and the new creation that is coming. Choose it over all that we feel and all that we think uh, in looking at the world around us. Choose it over our feelings. Choose it over our circumstances. Trust God, because if we don't, we will trust something else. And nothing good comes of that. And so I want to warn us at the end of this to find hope in God, because if we don't, we'll find hope in something else that'll leave us empty. Finally, there was a quote that was shared on Facebook I saw yesterday, and it's um, from, um, honestly, I don't know too much about him. It's Desmond Tutu. Uh, I hope that's how you say his name. Um, and it was shared by Jenny Bensley, or Julie Bensley, uh, on uh, Facebook. But it says this, Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. Now, I don't know much about the guy who said it. I, I did a little bit of research, and I don't know if he's a believer or not a believer in the end. I'm not sure. That's, I can't, I'm not going to judge that. But this quote came across to me. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite the darkness. Now, we could look at this two ways. One way could say, well, look, you can, find a, you can find the silver lining. You can find a bright spot no matter how dark the day is. And maybe that's what this quote was meant to say. But I saw it different. Because whether the... the whether he meant this this way or not, it comes across. Hope is being able to see that there is a light despite all the darkness. And who is the light that we can look to? Well, that's Jesus. Hope is in the light of Jesus, even when times are dark. So would you trust in him today? Would you hope in him? Would you find your ultimate hope in Jesus? Find your ultimate hope in choosing to follow him. Choose to hope, no matter how you feel. With that, let us close in prayer. God, I just want to thank you and praise you uh, that you have given us true hope. Help us to find that true hope during this time. Help us not to give up. Help us not to think that our hopes are based on our feelings or our circumstances, but that our hope is ultimately found in you. Help us to trust in you. Help us to choose it each day. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.